Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Baban Yar massacre um, and discussing more widely uh, representations of Ukrainian and Jewish shared past in literature. My name is Alessia Chromoychuk and I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London, a center for Ukraine-related educational and cultural activities. Just a quick warning that this webinar will be held in Ukrainian with simultaneous translation interpretation into English. Um, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Thank you very much uh, for joining us on our webinar, uh, 80 years of Babin Yar, Ukrainian Jewish Shared Post and Literature. I am Alessia Kromechuk. I am director of Ukrainian Institute London which is a cultural and educational center related to Ukraine. We raise issues pertaining not only to Ukraine, but to uh, the entire world. We are a charity, so we always uh, encourage you to make donations. We appreciate all of them. They enable us to hold some events free of charge. We are very glad that our co-organizers of our host today are any uh, Jewish encounter. That's uh, an organization with which we have been cooperating for uh, quite a while, and they support us in a number of joint projects. And I will uh, give the floor now to Natalia Fedoshak, uh, who joined Ukrainian Jewish Encounter in October 2013. With more than 20 years of international journalism experience, she has spent much of her career covering the former Soviet Union, from the empire's breakup to the challenges faced by the newly independent states. She has written uh, for leading publications in Europe and North America, including the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Washington Post, the Denver Post, and the Kiev Post. Natalia was, Natalia was a scholar as well as an international health journalism fellow with the Henry Koisner Family Foundation in Ukraine, fellow with the American Political Science Association in Washington, D.C. Natalia holds a bachelor's degree from George Washington University and a Master of International Affairs from Columbia University. Uh, Natalia, thank you very much for your support and for participation, and the floor is yours. You Ukrainian uh, Jewish Encounter is a Canadian NGO set up in 1978 to uh, deepen the understanding of the variety, diversity and complexity of Ukrainian Jewish relationships over years, with a focus on their future development. And it's my great pleasure and to be part of this webinar. Uh, to here to 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 and uh, the discussion that we are going to have today will enable us to understand uh, this tragedy better in uh, root causes, and I hope that we will be able to hear one another, uh, to find common ground. Uh, our organization uh, marked 75 years of uh, the Babin Yar uh, tragedy. We had a very interesting program, and I encourage you to uh, visit our website to see uh, what that program was like. And I'm looking forward to uh, today's discussion as well. Thank you, uh, Natalia, very much. You can see Ellen. It is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Anton Drobovich, uh, our moderator today. He is the head of the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory, responsible for formulating public policies on remembrance, developing commemorative practices, and leading research. He has had a, a career spanning academia, journalism, policy making, and museum development in Ukraine. He was an advisor to the Minister of Education in Ukraine and also 
also chaired the Department of Museum Planning at Mestetsky Arsenal, one of Ukraine's leading museums and curating to his appointment as the head of Ukrainian Institute of National Memory, Anton Drobovich curated educational programs at the Babaniar Holocaust Memorial Center. He is an ideal moderator for today's discussion. Anton, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Alessia, uh, for the introduction. Thank you, uh, Natalia, for your introductory uh, remarks. And I would like to thank uh, Ukrainian Institute London for uh, hosting this event, which is extremely important in the context of uh, yesterday's and today's events related to the commemoration of this tragedy. And it is a good opportunity for us uh, to remember the people uh, and to commemorate uh, the people uh, who perished then. Today we are going to speak not about uh, the history or historiography in terms of chronology of the events, but rather on the reflection of that history in the literary um, well, yeah, narrative. And I would first like to introduce our speakers. Uh, they are both poets and writers. It's um, Mariana Kijanowska. Uh, she uh, is uh, a poet, writer, translator, and literary scholar. Uh, she is um, a member of PEN Ukraine, and her works have been translated into English, Belarusian, Polish, Serbian, and Russian. She is also a, law, um, a winner of uh, Shevchen the Shevchenko National Prize for her collection of poetry, Babin Yar in voices and we will hear a couple of uh, poems from that collection today. Uh, she mm, uh, is a recipient of prestigious awards including Joseph Kornak Korzeniowski Literary Prize and the Kiev Laurels Literary Festival uh, Prize. Welcome Mariana Kianowska. We also have with us a writer, uh, the author of uh, 20 poems and essays in Russian and more recently in Ukrainian, it's uh, Boris Hersonsky. His works uh, have also been translated into various languages, including English, German, French, Italian, Dutch, etc. And uh, he received uh, the Yuri Shevelov Prize for his book An Open Diary in 2015 and the Voloshin Kiryenko Award for a significant contribution to the development of Ukrainian literature. So the list of awards is fairly long, uh, but uh, the enjoyment of their works is uh, even greater. And I encourage all of you after this webinar, if you haven't read uh, their poems, their essays and novels, to do so. Uh, Paris, uh, welcome as well. Uh, since I'm a historian, I have to introduce it into a historic context of Babeliar. On September 29 uh, and 30 in 1941, uh, the Nazi troop who uh, had occupied uh, Kiev, uh, the Ukrainian capital, a couple of days before, started a, a gross action. They um, summoned uh, the Jews uh, of uh, the city to a checkpoint um, and on uh, the 29th and 30th of September uh, they were corralled uh, to uh, this Babi, Babin Yar Ravin and uh, killed there. And later, uh, they uh, took 
record of uh, all those events and the chronology of uh, all those events very uh, thoroughly and meticulously. And according to uh, historians, uh, more than 100,000 uh, people were killed in uh, Babinyar, mostly Jews, uh, Roma and Sinti, uh, communists, uh, Soviet prisoners of war, Ukrainian nationalists, etc. So people who violated curfew, for example, were also killed and uh, buried there in Babinyar. So the memory of Babinyar is also uh, the memory of Holocaust. And Patrick Dubois, a uh, well-known researcher of uh, the Holocaust, uh, underscored uh, this inhumane way to introduce the industry of death into uh, the history of humankind. So uh, yesterday we had uh, a mass with representatives of uh, different confessions. Uh, we were talking to uh, the descendants of uh, those killed in Babin Yar who were traumatized and this trauma has to be voiced, has to be articulated, including in literature. Hence our topic and uh, some of uh, the first questions to our wonderful guests. It is both his a question of uh, or about history and about literature. Many people wrote about this tragedy um, in uh, mid 40s, in uh, 1943, 46, uh, and later in 1960s. Yeah. There, there is one artist, a uh, Russian artist who I spoke to in Ukraine, and he said, okay, uh, a lot has been written about uh, the Babinyar. So I think there is enough, but uh, nobody, uh, almost nobody knows that uh, the first text about uh, this tragedy appeared in Yiddish. Uh, and he also quoted Ilya Ehrenburg, Vasily Granovsky, and Vasil Shvets, uh, later Mikola Bajan, uh, Stuss, etc. But uh, very few uh, people, including experts, know about it. And I uh, will read out loud a poem of uh, 1946. Uh, he uh, was a poet and he was uh, the veteran of uh, World War II. Our children are rising from beneath the earth. They are underloved, undereducated. And this is a fragment from the poem of 1944. So, can you tell us since for seeming for forgetfulness about that? Yeah, this topic is very close to me. The uh, memory of Holocaust of uh, Babin Yar was suppressed over the entire Soviet history. Since, uh, uh, or from 1947, the so-called anti-Semitic campaign was uh, launched, leading to the Extra, ex, extermination of the entire literature and uh, poets and writers. So uh, you will know that uh, a lot of poets were arrested, uh, shot, killed, and the memory of Babin Yar uh, was tagged as Zionist propaganda. Uh, during the Stalin era and later uh, under uh, Khrushchev's reign, so uh, the uh, Jews' rights were not violated openly, but covertly. And I uh, happened to see some of the KGB documents uh, 
which stated that people are trying to commemorate uh, the Babin Yard tragedy and we have to stop this anti-Soviet provocation. So, uh, even before uh, Yevtushenko's uh, poem, uh, there were several uh, attempts to uh, do so in literature, but you will remember how that poem by Yevtushenko starts. There are no monuments over Babin Yar. And that was an admission by uh, the most popular Soviet poet that people tried to hush hush this tragedy. And uh, Shostakovich also included that poem into his uh, symphony number no. 13. Ilya Irinburg wrote about Babin Yar back in 1940, but uh, that was never promoted, that was never advanced as part of uh, the large Soviet literature. If I may add, we should understand uh, the way uh, the Soviet literature treated any type of trauma. It's not only about the Babin Yard tragedy and poetry related to it, be it in Russian or in Yiddish. But uh, the wartime poets, those poets who participated in World War uh, II, uh, who dared to write about it, would never see their poems uh, published or in print anywhere. So, and they had children and grandchildren uh, who would be preserving their works for uh, the um, generations to come. I would also add uh, the mentioning of uh, the phenomenon of Yevtushenko. Of course, he was the great poet, and he promoted this uh, topic even when it wasn't popular. And without diminishing the uh, role of uh, Yevgen Yevtushenko in actually trying to uh, preserve this memory uh, of uh, the Babin Yar uh, tragedy, we should uh, understand that, but for Yevgen Yevtushenko, uh, this very tragedy would have never been known to the Soviet people uh, after World War II. And uh, even though I've never uh, read about uh, it and I haven't got any documentary confirmation of the idea that I would like to share with you now, I will still uh, do it. Some time ago, I bought a book of Krakowska Vanguard uh, Yiddish uh, poetry in Poland, and uh, the authors uh, write in the preface that uh, Jewish poetry, poetry in Yiddish, is not uh, known to the Polish population altogether. And uh, they've got a huge uh, library of uh, Jewish poetry, but those who wrote in Yiddish are very little known in that country, and they are not also considered part of the Polish Jewish literature. So I guess, even though I didn't read anything about it, that uh, the matter is the language in which uh, poetry was uh, written. Yes, we are now speaking about uh, representations of the memory of Babin Yar in literature, and I would uh, like to invite everyone who's interested in this topic to read uh, Irina Zaharchuk's uh, article, Babin Yar in uh, 
in contemporary literature, and it's a wonderful ov overview of what has been written. And you will be amaz amazed uh, to learn how much has been written in Russian, in Ukrainian, in Yiddish. And, uh, and I've got another question to ask of you, which is uh, kind of a provocative uh, question. And I will be quoting from uh, very well reputed experts in this area or relying on uh, their ideas. Vasil Grossman, in his well known uh, essay, uh, Ukraine without Jews, and uh, uh, it, it was actually about uh, the Babi Yar tragedy. So at the very end of this essay, he says, people are very strange creatures because they can teach themselves uh, not to feel anything. You uh, can... Uh, lose your sleep if you see a child being uh, being uh, ridden over by a car, but you will forget everything about mass killings. And again, I uh, refer to uh, Elia Redburg and uh, Boris referred to him as well uh, earlier. And in 1944, he wrote about Babin Yarn. What's words, what's the pen if your uh, heart is heavy with the memory? So here, hence my question, is there any sense to speak about such uh, tragedies in uh, literature, in poetry, if we doubt that people can feel the grandeur of this tragedy? And can we treat it as somebody else's uh, memory, not ours? I would answer in the following way. In the times of the civil war, People said that you can imagine dozens of shootings, but if you read the list of shot uh, people containing dozens and hundreds of those, you uh, lose this perception of the tragedy. So, and here we are speaking about uh, 52,000 of people killed over uh, the period of two days. It is beyond imagination. You can only measure and feel the tragedy through your compassion with the tragedy of one single person rather than 52,000 people. And Mariana uh, actually learned about this tragedy through interviewing very specific people. Uh, I can't remember who said that, but uh, somebody said that uh, when one person is killed, it's a tragedy, but when 100,000 people are killed, it's just statistics. So we should, again, uplift the statistics to an individual tragedy. Mariana, what do you think? say that I haven't uh, haven't got any Jewish roots and my personal story and my relation to uh, this understanding of what Holocaust is about and what the memory of the Jewish people is about stems from very special metaphysical nature of uh, my acquaintance with those uh, specific people. And it took me a long time to cover this road to learn about those people, including Boris Hirsonsky. I uh, 
translated some documents uh, from the Rutenia or archives uh, that was uh, Boris Hersonsky's uh, book and that expanded my understanding, my cross uh, and and deepened my uh, grasp of uh, the idea that um, Holocaust is not about uh, statistics, but rather about specific people, specific households, specific histories and stories of people who perished. Since 2014, I've uh, been traveling to uh, the east of Ukraine a lot. And when my book, uh, Bourbon Your in Voices, was published, I had an opportunity to meet with people in uh, Stanitsa Luhanska, very close to the contact line. And I uh, saw it with my own eyes that uh, the tragedy of death, the tragedy of uh, people who are killed uh, during uh, armed conflicts just is exacerbated by the fact that they remain nameless. In my own uh, city or town of Zhovva in Lviv uh, region, uh, we also have uh, a, a smaller babiniar of Zhovva. Uh, about 16,000 uh, people were killed there, but we only know the names of a couple of families uh, who were exterminated there. And when uh, I was writing those uh, poems, I was focused on these names that I knew at that time. It's hard to explain, but uh, uh, at that time I had a kind of a um, mystical uh, experience of uh, relating to one name, Rahila, Rachel. And I uh, learned her story and I lived her story. In this context, I have got a question to ask of you about this uh, block of your book about somebody else's memory. Quite recently, I uh, publicly discussed this topic with uh, Sergei Loznitsa, Ukrainian film director, and uh, I remember him saying that uh, the memory of uh, Babin Yar is the memory of Ukrainian people, but rather of uh, the Jewish people. Do you agree with that? Because Zuba said some time ago that it is a tragedy of both, Ukrainian and Jewish people. Is there any link here? Would you agree with Leznitsa? You're asking uh, me, um, who is uh, the uh, translator, uh, and I've been translating poems for 30 years, and I'm the medium, uh, the, uh, the tie, the uh, linking chain uh, between two languages and two nations. And I uh, get warmer with uh, uh, both nations and I get colder with both nations. Uh, to me, it's about coexistence of uh, nations, of uh, people, of ethnic groups uh, that do not assimilate, but uh, coexist and share space and time and existence. It's very close to the laws of thermodynamics, actually. If we start thinking about Babin Yar as a tragedy of Jewish people alone, then we would be no different from fascists. 
because it's only through this division into uh, us and them, ours and aliens. Uh, so uh, those dividing lines mark the first step towards towards hate speech. And I think that the world is much more complex than that much more diverse and interlinked and when uh, there are wildfires uh, somewhere in uh, the jungle in brazil we suffer as well to us that wildfire means climate change and it will affect us when people die by bullets when people who used to be your neighbors are killed then you suffer as well we are speaking about the number of uh, victims of babinyar but uh, uh, according to this theory of uh, three handshakes there would be no uh, single citizen of Kiev or Kievite who wouldn't have lost a relative or a neighbor. I would say, say uh, all of them were affected because they lost uh, a neighbor or a loved one or a classmate uh, or a colleague, etc. Yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, this experience tragedy was uh, absolutely global to Ukrainians. Uh, almost every city or town had a bobbin yard of its own. Because Jewish communities lived everywhere and they were affected everywhere by that by that tragedy. I, I uh, would not uh, actually dispute here with uh, uh, Loznitsa because I respect him as a film director and I uh, think that he's a true artist. I've uh, seen six of his uh, movies but I would uh, disagree on that uh, because uh, Ukraine for a long time had no narrative of uh, Babin Yar. We didn't know how to speak about it, how to articulate this tragedy. We still don't know how to discuss the Berlin uh, tragedy, uh, which po uh, Poles would uh, tag as a Berlin massacre again. We still uh, are not prepared to discuss Chernobyl openly and sincerely. So we haven't got this mechanism or mechanics uh, of grief or culture of grief and nobody has ever thought of why when Ukrainian Cossacks died, Ukrainian uh, nation had uh, folk songs about their great deeds and their subsequent deaths. But when we lived through uh, the uh, Euromaidan, uh, the only song that we uh, sang at that time when uh, the Heavenly Hundred were killed was Plivikacha. Uh, and now we are living through this war, through this armed conflict, but we still don't have the toolkit of grief so that we can relieve and uh, express our grief. So any artist, uh, be it composer, poet, uh, say 
writer, uh, the one who works for the mass media, we should all contribute to this culture of grief. Uh, thank you. Um, Boris, will you respond to what Mariana has said? And after that, I would uh, ask you to read your poems, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you. I would like to say that Ukraine lived through a lot of tragedies. They started back uh, in uh, the ancient times with uh, Bati who captured Kiev. And unlike in Russia, in Ukraine, uh, we have uh, the tools to discuss and express uh, our, our grief. Uh, it's not only Plinne Kacha Putisini, but also Bishop Kozak Zadunai Tam of Chizhom Ukrai. And a lot of other folk, Ukrainian folk uh, uh, songs uh, that actually are about grief and death. Whereas uh, Russians uh, in their uh, victory uh, uh, narrative, they would be saying we uh, need one a victory uh, no matter what the price might be. So we've got this ethnic model of the nation that we are still discussing. And sometimes we forget that it, we've got a very diverse nation. We have got uh, uh, ethnic Ukrainians and we have got the Ukrainian people with lots of uh, ethnic groups. So we cannot say that uh, the uh, tragedy of Babin Yar affected uh, Jews uh, alone. We all know that it was a huge loss to the entire Ukrainian nation, but we sh uh, cannot also turn a blind eye to the conflict between Ukrainians and Jews that has or had been uh, in uh, place for a long time. In uh, Kiev, in the very center of the city, there's this monument to uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky between uh, two cathedrals, St. Sophia Cathedral and St. Michael Cathedral that was uh, just destroyed and then uh, restored. And he said that uh, we are here uh, in uh, Kiev, which is a dawn of Eastern Orthodoxy. So, so uh, I know uh, the model of this monument and the uh, the uh, horse on which uh, uh, which uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky is mounting uh, actually uh, was supposed to have uh, also uh, several emblems and uh, insignia uh, but uh, money was short and they did not complete the monument yes uh, we uh, do remember Shevchenko, uh, Shevchenko's lines uh, against uh, uh, Jews and Poles, and it is all related. Uh, and we say that uh, Babin Yar is our universal shared common tragedy. And I agree with uh, Mariana uh, in that today we see a certain consequences uh, of uh, events taking place somewhere far away, thousands of kilometers away from us. Uh, thanks to the media, thanks to the social media in particular, it's not about printed media, uh, about uh, newspapers, but uh, every day on television, on uh, social media, we can see lots of various tragedies. For example, when uh, the uh, ISIS terrorists decapitated their victims, we saw it uh, in front of our eyes. And I have to say that 
uh, when you can find uh, documentaries uh, on YouTube how uh, Uh, how uh, public executions were carried out in uh, 1946 uh, in Kiev, we have to accept that as a tragedy as well. So our understanding of uh, the Babinyar tragedy uh, will uh, come to us and will uh, be shared when we believe that we are all part of uh, the Ukrainian people. And as John Don uh, said, don't ask uh, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Thank you, Boris. That's a wonderful concept of a uh, political nation that's part of uh, the Ukrainian constitution of today. And I hope that we will um, live up to this notion and we will be skilled enough and experienced enough to uh, analyze uh, it thoroughly. So now to poems. Who will start? As you know, I uh, write uh, poetry in Russian and in Ukrainian, sometimes uh, um, in both languages, sometimes in three languages. Uh, my first uh, uh, poem is in Russian. Почти что четвероногая. Раньше были такие. Раньше были писцы, считавшие буквы в слове, и комментаторы толковали не смысл, а числа, потому что смысл похоронен в земле в основе, а бы смыслиться радугой над головой повисла. Каждый охотник желает знать, где сидят фазаны. Каждый охотник идет на пролом с ружьем, с заряженным дробью. Каждый каратель желает знать, где сидят партизаны. Каждый глупец считает, что создан по образу и подобию. Каждый считает, что его из праха земного лепил предвечный мастер своими руками. И рыба мудрости в море печали помедлив немного — now I will invite Maria Montague to read uh, the translation of uh, this uh, poem in English. Where are you, Jews of the Levant, the wise men of Maghreb? Where are you, theologians of incomparable Cappadocia? Wisdom floats in a sea of sorrow like an ancient fish. Four-legged fish of the past must have looked like this. There used to be scribes who counted letters in words and commentators who interpreted numbers instead of meaning. Because the meaning is buried in the ground and nonsense hangs like a rainbow overhead. Every hunter wants to know where the pheasants sit. Every hunter goes ahead with a loaded shotgun. Every punisher wants to know where the partisans hide. Every fool thinks he was created in the image and the likeness. Everyone believes the eternal master sculpted him from the dust of the earth with his own hands. And the fish of wisdom in a sea of sorrow hesitates, floating away from us, moving its four fins. Translated from Russian by Nina Kosman. Thank you, Maria. No, uh, now I will uh, read a poem that was written in two languages at a time. So it has got uh, the uh, versions in both English and Ukrainian. 
На лівому плечі сидить Мойсей, на правому плечі Аарон, що почут вухи йому премудрі за двох баків. Це усна Тора, непорушний закон. Хто його не вчить, той зовсім здорів. Кошерна риба пливе в медовій ріщі. На дасі сидить лелека. Пасеться молочна хмара від хмари м'ясної далека. Ніхто не наважиться зварити казання. Знов таки в молодці. Кази дерези, що куплена на ярмарку за три гроша, що мав у руці. А був хороший ярмарок, і непоганий сиру шматок, і каза хороша, дійна, слабка напередок, і синагога простора, кожен знайде свій куток, і поліцейський вусатий, пострубатий в зубах свисток. Але все це тут, на небі, де хала лежить на столі. І все ж таки нам цікаво, що залишилося там, на землі. Як там сусідські діти в достатку, мабуть, в теплі, знаходять досі золоті коробки в залі. Напевно, якщо знаходять, думаю, пощастило. Замість кладовища парк, там дівчина спирається на весло. У синагозі клуб, там танці або церкви. Христос воскрес. Шкода такі подробиці не розгадиш з небес. A rabbi in heaven sits on a golden throne. On his left shoulder sits Moses, on his right shoulder Aaron. They whisper wisdom in the ears from both sides. This is the oral Torah, the unbreakable law. A kosher fish swims in the river of honey. A cloud of milk grazes in a cloud of meat in the distance. No one dares to boil a baby goat again in the milk of a she-goat bought for three pennies at a town fair. It was a good fair, and the town was not bad at all. And its goat was a good milking goat, and its synagogue was wide and east-facing, and its mustachioed policeman sported a whistle in his crooked teeth. And now they are all here in the sky, where the chala is laid out on the table. And yet I wonder about what's left down there on earth, how the neighbor's children's, how the neighbor's children are. Are they well off and warm? Do they still find crowns in the ashes? If they do, they probably believe they are lucky. Where the cemetery was before, a girl leans on her paddle in a park. In a synagogue, there's a dance club or maybe a church. Christ has risen. Pity that from your heaven you cannot see the details. Translated from Ukrainian by Nina Kosman. Apologies, I, um, I mispronounced Hala and then was distracted. I didn't do such a good job with the second half of the poem. Vibachta <laughs> Borisa. Thank you, uh, Boris, uh, particularly for your second uh, poem dedicated to a uh, Alexander Roybrid. Uh, wonderful uh, Ukrainian Jewish painter, artist, representative of that uh, political nation that you've discussed. Uh, he uh, died quite uh, recently. And when you were uh, reading that poem, I uh, heard him speak, actually. Thank you very much. Yes, I dedicated this poem to uh, Alexander Roybert, who I uh, knew for 35 years, almost all my life. And I think that his last years where the years of fighting for the art gallery in Odessa and for the Ukrainian idea of a unified political nation. And that took a lot of his effort, of his strength, of his health. And uh, during uh, the 
a commemoration ceremony, uh, we noted that uh, he will be well remembered and we will publish his poems that will be illustrated by a Ukrainian poet and writer Serhii Jadan. And uh, before, it was Alexander Roybert who would illustrate uh, Jadan's uh, poems, a collection of poems. So you see this uh, universal connection, uh, these links and this memory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boris. Mariana, will you read a couple of your poems, please? While I'm sharing my screen, I would encourage uh, the participants to uh, stop sending your questions. Kimnati <laughs> Айзен за група зондер команда, поліцаї СС розстрільна. Ми з Давидом були щасливі. Ми з Давидом були щасливі. Ми з Давидом були щасливі. Ми з Давидом любили. Мама вранці його прибігла. Мама вранці його прибігла. Мама вранці його прибігла. Запитала, чи знаю. Я не знала, всю ніч не спала. Я не знала, всю ніч не спала. Я не знала, всю ніч не спала. Чула постріли з яр. Я не маю вже, каже син. Я не маю вже, каже сина. Я не маю вже, каже сина. А тебе проклинаю. Ти живеш, а його не стало. Ти живеш, а його не стало. Ти живеш, а його не стало. Май це вірку за кару. Я за кару це мама маю. От стою і співаю, щоб не чути пострілів з яру. І потрошки мираю. In the room there hung, in the room there hung, in the room there hung wedding dress, white and long. Now I put it away. Now I put it away, now I put it away, for my David got killed. Einsatzgruppe Sonderkommando, Einsatzgruppe Sonderkommando, Einsatzgruppe Sonderkommando, an SS execution squad. We were happy, David and I. We were happy, David and I. We were happy, David and I. David and I were in love. In the morning his mother came, in the morning his mother came, in the morning his mother came, asked me if I already knew. Didn't know, didn't sleep all night, didn't know, didn't sleep all night, didn't know, didn't sleep all night, heard some shots from the yard. I'm a mother no more, she said, I'm a mother no more, she said, I'm a mother no more, she said, may you woman be cursed. He's gone and you're still alive. He's gone and you're still alive. He's gone and you're still alive. That's your punishment, Vika. That's my punishment, Mama dear. So I sway and I sing a ditty, drowning out the shots from the yar, dying little by little. Вірш, яким кричу, тому що можу тільки це робити, тільки це. 
вірш, який роботу робить, Божу, а тоді роздряпує лице, зведене судомою до кості, і горить Антоновим вогнем, вірш ненатлий, вірш у високості, йду з ним, як Рахилю, вифлеєм, сине туге, вірше, Веньяміне, сам у полі воїн, сам же й радь, в кублах зір, отруйна, кровоспинна. Сигми, лідер, стигмами горять, стигмами. The poem with which I scream because I can only do this, nothing else. The poem that works as a God-given cause tearing into your face, cramped in a scowl to the very bone, scorching like Antony's fire. This insatiable poem conceived above, I carry it like Rachel to Ephrath, son of morning, poem Benjamin all at once, and the legions in the nests of tears. A healing venom, sigmas of letters, smoldering like stigmas. Here I should make a very brief introduction before I start reading. This book, Babin Your Voices, gives voice to many children, even more voices of children can be found in poems that have not become part of this book. I know how it uh, came around, but I think that uh, every other poem was written to give a voice to a child. I never thought how many children were killed in Babin Yar together with their mothers and fathers. У мене будуть діти, я і Йоня, і буде два чи три автомобілі, і буде шрам великий на долоні, і голубник, і навіть миші білі, і буде мама ніжна і ласкава, і з ніжними, і теплими руками. Я виживу, бо я не маю права померти тут, в цій ямі, сам, без мами. If I survive, I'll simply be a dad, like any dad, like mine or Raya's. I'll carry gingerbreads to give away. I'll simply be a dad. Dads do not die. I'll have some kids myself and Yona and three or four automobiles. I'll sport a scar on my right palm and keep a dovecoat and I'll be no mice. I'll have a mother, gentle, kind. Her hands will feel so soft, so warm. I will survive. I have no right to die here in this ditch, alone, without my mum. Thank you, uh, Boris, Mariana, uh, for these poems, uh, for these feelings. And I'm sure that many people on both sides of the ocean can feel this compassion and can feel what uh, this tragedy is about. Thank you very much. Olesa 
Have we got any questions uh, to our wonderful speakers? Yes, we um, are collecting uh, uh, questions. Uh, we haven't yet grouped them. Uh, Arisa, could you ask uh, your question in person? Yeah, you are here with us. Aren't you? Will you please switch on your camera and your mic? Good afternoon. I am extremely moved uh, and uh, I am grateful to both of you for your generous sharing of uh, your feelings uh, through uh, poems, uh, through literature. I've uh, grown up in uh, Germany on uh, Selen Stodesfuge and uh, every time I uh, am uh, um, at a loss when I hear about uh, this uh, difference uh, that is uh, seen between different ethnic groups within one uh, nation. Um, I, I live in the UK now uh, and I don't have a direct access to uh, the Ukrainian society, uh, but I uh, feel it like uh, Ukrainian people are still divided. Why is it so? You will know that uh, the president of Ukraine uh, is uh, a Jew and he was uh, elected by 73% of Ukrainian voters. So I wouldn't say that there is uh, this artificial division into ethnic groups. So ethnic thinking or ethnic mindset is still there. It is related to ethnic cultures and to traditions, religion, customs, Ukrainian ethnic group and uh, a Jewish ethnic group have historically different traditions, customs, uh, cultures and religion. But most of those killed in Bobin Yar were not ethnically Jews. Uh, and even those who were ethnic Jews, they were not culturally Jewish, uh, they did not belong to uh, Judaism, because at that time they were all part of the large Soviet people. And under Stalin, it was prohibited to teach in uh, Yiddish, uh, and there were, uh, and and the prohibition to teach in Hebrew uh, was introduced uh, back in um, 1918, even before Stalin, at the very dawn of the Soviet Union. So the. Uh, the latest case that was uh, adjudicated uh, in the Soviet Union and it was investigated by KGB was against a teacher who taught in Hebrew. And I think that today we are not that divided as we used to be before. And I will give you my own example. I. Uh, entered a uh, medical school uh, in ivano Frankivsk, and I completed my first year of studies there. And we were walking uh, along the street with uh, uh, two girls, Marika and um, Hanka, and Marika was uh, walking by my side, uh, actually criticizing the Soviet uh, power. And uh, the other one, Hanka, uh, said, I'm, he uh, I'm here, I'm listening in. I hear what you say. But they say, just, it doesn't matter because 
we all, be it uh, of Ukrainian origin or of Jewish uh, origin, uh, are most critical of the Soviet government. And I was listening to them, and when I was interviewed by uh, a KGB agent, uh, was asked if I uh, knew that uh, that uh, the family of uh, Mariko were uh, Ukrainian bourgeois nationalists, and that uh, so I said no, I uh, had no idea about it. If I may uh, contribute, uh, last year uh, it was September, as far as I can uh, remember, one uh, platform called uh, Ukraina Moderna, uh, Modern Ukraine. There was an article. Uh, by Sergei Kerchik. It, it was called Stalin's uh, ethnic uh, policy, communities of survival. And uh, the uh, philosophers of culture will uh, know that uh, this idea of uh, otherness becomes uh, important and significant uh, when uh, people face certain threats and when this image of a common enemy is being construed in order to bring people together. So the, uh, this idea of otherness uh, has always been uh, there, and uh, we are speaking about uh, Jews in Ukraine. The same pertains to this dichotomy of uh, Lviv uh, residents versus uh, uh, Kievans or uh, Lviv residents living in Kiev. So uh, this otherness uh, has always been uh, present in any community, in any society. But uh, today in Ukraine, thanks God, this idea is not that strong. Even despite uh, the armed conflict, despite the war, and even uh, though uh, we are at the very beginning of uh, the formation of certain uh, genre of, uh, of uh, literature, of uh, essays and journalism, uh, but we don't have this widespread of hate speech. And again, I say, thank God. Uh, say, 10 years ago, when we mocked a uh, 70th anniversary of uh, this tragedy, uh, it was a very, uh, kept very low profile. Uh, it, it was very subdued, I would say. Uh, few people would be discussing that publicly. And the story of uh, Jews as the others uh, actually uh, dates back uh, or roots in uh, Stalin's policy and even farther away in uh, time, uh, in uh, the 14th, 15th, and uh, 16th centuries. And Yaroslav Gritsak, Ukrainian historian, wrote about it. Uh, we uh, do not juxtapose ourselves uh, to the uh, Jews. We do not see uh, us as alien to Jews. We see ourselves as alien to totalitarian regimes. Yesterday, on the 29th of September, uh, in Kiev, in Babin Yar, uh, two rabbis uh, met with three uh, with three uh, priests, uh, Christian priests, uh, so a Greek Catholic uh, Church, uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and and uh, there was a priest who uh, spoke on behalf of Anufri, Metropolitan of uh, the Russian uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine. 
So you will remember that 29,000 uh, Jews were uh, killed on that very day, on the 29th of September, eight years ago. Uh, and uh, all of those uh, rabbis and priests came together just to be together there in time and space uh, that can uh, help us better commemorate and make sure that uh, we would not be alienated from one another. We would not uh, be juxtaposing us against them. And I understand that there are forces that would like to uh, get us divided. And uh, that is exacerbated because of uh, the current situation, because of this armed conflict. But we uh, are there to keep people together. Thank you very much, uh, Arisia, for your question. Uh, we are still asking for your questions. You can write them in English, it's not a problem, or you can ask them in English and we'll translate. And I would uh, ask Maria Montague to ask uh, her question and to thank her for a wonderful reading of uh, the poems. Thank you, Alessa. I'll try to speak in Ukrainian. Perhaps I will ask Alessa to help me in that. Mariana, I would like to ask you about uh, your literary process. How do you write uh, poems? The characters, uh, the protagonists of your poems are so real, so authentic. And uh, when you were writing, how did you relate uh, to those uh, protagonists or characters. Can you tell us that? I'm often asked that question, and uh, there are several levels of uh, sincerity that I would practice uh, while answering. And uh, today I will uh, be uh, extremely sincere. In 2013, I lost my father. Uh, he uh, died of cancer very fast. And I didn't have the time to mourn his death because I had to travel to another country because I won a scholarship. When I uh, came back home some time later, I felt that grief which was not cried out, which I didn't have a chance and time to express, uh, to, um, to vent. A bit later, I went to the contact line together with some volunteers from Kharkiv, and I heard a lot of uh, stories of uh, those volunteers' life. And I spoke to um, internally uh, displaced persons um, in Lviv. I particularly met one young woman who was looking for a way to earn her livelihood in Lviv. And uh, I heard so many stories of all those people that I started writing poems about events in Donbass, in eastern Ukraine, on the contact line. And while I uh, was uh, writing those poems, I was showing them to my friends, and they amazingly perceived them as poems about Babin Yar. I was uh, struck, I was at awe. At the same time, I was invited to uh, read some poems uh, in Babin Yar, and it was when we uh, read those poems together with uh, Boris. Uh, I had several new poems that I wrote after uh, being uh, invited uh, to that uh, to that audition, uh, and then I uh, thought of 
writing poems about Babin uh, Yar after that, uh, that recital. So, uh, there are several uh, poems not actually written about Babi Yar, but today they are read as if they were. And those voices uh, were the voices that I heard inside my head. I was pregnant with those poems and I had to give birth to them. I wrote 302 poems in within three months. Uh, uh, the book only uh, contains one third of those. And I'm still um, very... Uh, very depressed and very uh, moved when I start reading uh, those or reciting those uh, poems, reading them out uh, aloud. Uh, uh, they stuck in my throat as a lump uh, because every time I experience that tragedy and over uh, the last few weeks, I recollected this experience of writing uh, those poems, and that was an uh, awful experience. I couldn't move. I uh, was lying in my bed, and the very last six poems were written on the day of my father's death, or just the anniversary of my father's death. And then it took me six months to select uh, poems that would be included into this collection, Babi Yar and Voices. And again, I sought advice uh, from my friends, um, which should be there and which shouldn't. Some said uh, that I should include all of them, but I understood that uh, it would be too much. And uh, actually, the arrangement of all those uh, poems in a in that collection uh, was uh, yet another uh, challenging effort. And I will tell you that I don't remember any of those poems by heart. And I haven't changed a single word uh, since I wrote uh, those uh, poems. It was just an impulse. It was a concept that was uh, somewhere in my head and I tried several times to stop writing those uh, poems, but I couldn't. Thank you very much, Mariana, for a very sincere and open answer. We've got a, a question from Oksana Guseva uh, for uh, Boris. Can you tell us uh, from what uh, collection of poems uh, are those uh, poems that you read? Will you unmute yourself, please? Is it one and the same collection or are these uh, two different books? The Ukrainian version of the second poem is from the book, which is called uh, Print Out. And very soon, uh, two uh, volumes of uh, uh, my book will appear in print. Uh, one is called Raspichatka and the second one, Rozdrukivka. It's all uh, print out, but in Russian and in second, uh, uh, the second is in Ukrainian. And uh, it actually sends us back to the times of uh, the so called Sambedov or uh, Samizdat. And uh, the first uh, uh, poem is from uh, the Duch Elitera uh, book called. Uh, with uh, fire and uh, scent. And uh, Mariana Kianowska uh, wrote a preface to that, uh, to that book, for which I'm extremely thankful. Thank you. I can't see any questions from uh, our participants, and uh, uh, if I may, I will ask uh, my own question of both of you. My first question uh, is to uh, Boris, and my second is uh, uh, to Anton. Boris, you are a very well-known uh, poet, and you're uh, also a psychologist and a psychiatrist. 
Kutje comment on uh, the relation between uh, personal individual trauma and the trauma of the entire nation. And uh, is this uh, latter articulated enough? If uh, not enough, what should be done in order uh, to uh, change the situation? My second question is to Anton and other panelists. Uh, Ukraine uh, recently celebrated its uh, 30th anniversary of independence and ideal in uh, the issues of uh, memory and uh, it is very difficult to to uh, commemorate uh, various events, various tragedies, particularly such tragedy as uh, Babin Yar. Without going into too much detail, I would uh, like to ask uh, all of you, in the ideal world, how should we commemorate Babin Yar in uh, Ukraine? or the entire tragedy of uh, World War II in uh, Ukraine's territory? I will be very brief. First of all, being psychologists and as uh, individuals, as poets, we uh, should be speaking about individual traumas, not about traumas of the entire people. These can be traumas or these cannot be traumas, uh, but it's up to people. They uh, select uh, themselves what to treat as trauma. In Odessa, for example, in uh, 1941, about 10,000 Jews were were incinerated in an artillery depot um, uh, in Odessa, as I said. And uh, they are seldom uh, mentioned, they are seldom spoken about. And on the 1st of May uh, 2014, uh, 40 plus people uh, died in a fire in uh, the trade union's uh, palace. And we speak about it a lot. We still believe that it's a huge loss uh, to the country, irrespective of political allegiances of those people. So, and uh, we discuss it, uh, and uh, uh, some people call it Odessa's but uh, the killing of 10,000 uh, Jews in Odessa back in 1941 is never mentioned. So they are not treated as, uh, as uh, a, a tragedy. Uh, quite recently, I uh, visited uh, the... Jewish cemetery in Odessa, uh, the only one that has uh, um, been preserved because uh, two were destroyed. And I saw one uh, grave and uh, the clock said that it was a memorial uh, to uh, the Holocaust victims and it was erected by uh, American Jews. And uh, there is one more monument in uh, the artillery park. It used to be a park, actually. Today it isn't. And uh, they've got a, a monument. So uh, for a certain person, it will be a trauma, but for another, it won't. And your second question is uh, fairly compli complex. And uh, I think that... Uh, uh, the country, the state, should remember its citizens uh, who perished again, uh, regardless of the idea uh, that they espoused. And in Odessa, uh, in 28, 
18, no, in 1918, uh, there was a battle between uh, uh, Ukrainians and the communists, uh, Ukrainian Cossacks and communists, and uh, uh, monuments to both parties were erected to commemorate uh, that battle. Later on, uh, only the communist uh, monument uh, was preserved, uh, and it is still there, and nobody uh, has ever thought of actually mentioning that Sichuvistrilci uh, also were killed in that battle. If I may add, Polit political science, social sciences, uh, uh, psychology, um, use this notion of projective behavioral change. When a certain model is established, which uh, uh, is shaped over uh, an individual's life. And oftentimes, this shaping of the behavioral model is affected by uh, the family, but not only the family, but also by school, by environment, by peers, and by the governmental or public policies. And this model, uh, or the, the uh, shaping of this model should start in early childhood. And when a, a grown-up person chooses a way how to experience trauma, how to live through trauma, and how to overcome it, we should always remember this behavioral model and we should take care of traumatized people and treat them with respect. We should always remember about respect. It seems obvious, but uh, very people um, uh, think about it, that back in uh, the 19th century, respect of children, respect of uh, women were not a universal category. Um, so uh, you will remember that Korchuk uh, wrote about uh, a book, uh, Child's Right to Respect. And he started writing that book uh, during World War I in Kiev. Which, uh, and that book actually caused an entire shift of paradigm in uh, uh, pedagogical sciences. Um, so we should start talking about uh, respect and start uh, forming this respect in a person as a model of behavior. Uh, respect of your neighbors, respect of your um, family, respect of other people and uh, respect of other nations. So we understand that uh, the world is uh, a very diverse and complex uh, uh, entity and uh, what is good for one nation might not be quite acceptable uh, in another nation. But uh, respect should be the basis on which our mutual understanding and coexistence should lean. Anything to add? Yes, Alessia. Dating uh, the trauma for 30 years of uh, the entire period of Ukraine's independence. And we are just approaching uh, those contact points, uh, particularly in the context of the armed conflict of the war, it is extremely di difficult. And the conflict changes optics, and it has always been uh, so in uh, various countries. So we are almost there, I would say. But can we say that we are close to the completion of this entire uh, process. No, in 1990s, when university professors had to uh, uh, to sell goods in the open air market, uh, it, they didn't have the time to analyze history and to uh, deep deeply think of uh, what happened. Uh, 80 years ago. 
But I think that time is uh, the uh, uh, most limited resource in any country. Uh, will we have enough time and enough wisdom to develop this narrative to uh, actually to voice our trauma? Uh, it's uh, an open uh, question. And we have to write this uh, book of our life, of our identity, of uh, uh, our relations. And there is uh, this abyss or the precipice that divides us from uh, the Second World War. It's one thing that uh, we are trying to get rid of our totalitarian past. And a person, uh, Vasil Grossman, uh, who was a World War II veteran and a poet, and he uh, was uh, well respected and he could insist on certain attitudes. But uh, imagine Vasil Schwitz with his poem that I referred to at the very beginning of our conversation and would say, Why are you dispute, discussing it? Uh, 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 whether the tragedy is Ukrainian or, or Jewish. Uh, so just what are you talking about? People, so this uh, authority of eyewitnesses, of those who bear witness to those, dis, uh, those uh, events uh, would have uh, speeded up, accelerated the entire process of articulating the trauma and pre preserving the memory. But we had this gap um, between uh, 1945 and uh, uh, 1990s. So only after um, gaining uh, independence uh, did we have an opportunity to return to uh, the memory and start forming it and discussing it and articulating this trauma. And we have to be changing this situation, to be overcoming this or bridging this gap. And if we fail to do so, then we might perish as a nation. Thank you very much for uh, your answer. I would like to thank all participants of this discussion, which comes uh, to its end. And I would like to thank all of you for your participation. And I would like to give the floor to Natalia Fedusha. First of all, Mariana uh, Boris Anton, uh, thank you very much for uh, a very um, deep, revealing and very sincere uh, discussion um, that uh, is uh, available on our website in PDF format. And we uh, support uh, the publishing house uh, Duchen publishes and offers to its readers. And you can even download uh, Mariana's book uh, today. Boris is going to be the residence in the literal residency that we are supporting in Buchich in Ukraine. And his books will also be available on our website. So yeah, uh, I encourage you to visit our site and to read those poems. Thank you very much, Natalia. I would like to thank uh, Mariana Kianovska, Boris Khersonsky, Anton Drobovich, and uh, Natalia Fedushevich from Ukrainian Jewish Encounter uh, for uh, this discussion, as well as uh, uh, the interpreter. And I would like to thank all of uh, the participants of this uh, webinar dedicated to uh, the 80th anniversary of uh, the Babin Yar tragedy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.